Nicole Stecklang, technical agronomist for DeKalb and Asgrow in Northeast Iowa. I always say that you don't learn much in a perfect year. You learn more in a tough year. We're gonna learn a lot this year. It has been a crazy growing season so far and I'm expecting some more craziness going forward. So, wanna do a little rundown of what we're seeing, what's going on, why those things are going on, and then some predictions for the future. Our territory in Northeast Iowa, particularly far Northeast Iowa, we've been drier than a popcorn fart. And a lot of times, in order to look forward, we have to look back. Heck, even just to make sense of what we're seeing in the present, we have to look back. So if you guys remember, and I'm sure you remember, because it's what we've been stressing about for the last month, is how dry it was after planting. So we saw a lot of restricted root growth because of how dry we were. Not only was it restricted because of perhaps a sidewall compaction issue, but we were so hot and so dry that we saw a lot of those furrows starting to open up and we saw a fair amount of rootless corn syndrome starting. And if it didn't get to the severity of rootless corn syndrome, this root growth absolutely was slowed down because it didn't have the water to grow and it didn't want to grow into those super dry, super hot conditions. So we've already got restricted root growth because of that. Now add on to the fact that this plant is like a guy who got in a bar fight and has got his jaw wired shut. He is not getting nutrition unless it's liquid through a straw. Same thing with these plants. Now in Northeast Iowa, we're used to driving by yellow corn and saying that's probably nitrogen deficiency because it's too wet. This is the first time in my career I have seen such widespread and severe potassium deficiency. Now in most cases, it's not because the fertilizer is not out there. It's because the plant simply cannot access it because that potassium is not in solution. If we get some rain, it's going to, you know, it's going to fix that problem. Now, when we're looking at nutrient deficiencies, this is a lot of what we're going to find. So this is actually potassium deficiency where we see the yellowing along the margins or the outside edges of that leaf. Now you take a look at this leaf right here and this is showing symptoms of nitrogen deficiency where that yellowing is coming down the midrib. Since both potassium and nitrogen are mobile within the plant, you're gonna see these deficiencies showing up at the bottom of the plant in the older leaves because as this plant is growing, it's going to steal nutrients from that old growth to put it into the new growth. The opposite is true of sulfur deficiency. Sulfur is not mobile in the plant. So you're gonna see these, defi these deficiency symptoms in the newer growth as opposed to in the older growth. So like I said before, rain is going to fix a lot of these issues, especially if we do have good soil tests for potassium. However, as I look to the future and I think, how is this going to affect us? Potassium plays a huge role in stock integrity. So now I'm trying to figure out what fields do I maybe not have the highest potash level in or what fields did I notice this deficiency in? That's going to spoke in my mind, hey, what fields do I maybe need to prioritize for harvest later in the season? The other portion is that potassium plays a pretty big role in this plant's immune system. So now I'm also considering if I have a weakened immune system because of lack of potassium, how do I need to think about maybe upcoming diseases or fungicide applications? That's the nutrient deficiency fun fact that we've got going on, but we're gonna keep talking about how lack of rain is going to affect our roots continually. So I'm expecting to see a pretty big corn rootworm year, and that's really twofold. One of them is because since we didn't get a whole lot of moisture, if we put soil plight insecticide on here, our zone of protection is pretty small. We didn't move that insecticide out. We didn't get it in very much solution. So we aren't protecting a very large volume of soil or protecting a larger volume of these roots. Reason number two is because moisture is how mother nature helps us out with our rootworm populations. A lot of times we tend to think that, oh, we had a hard cold winter, that's gonna take care of the rootworm. We've actually gotta be looking at temperatures of about 13 below before temperature kills corn rootworm eggs. The way mother nature helps us is with moisture and by drowning them out in late May and early June before they can do a whole lot of feeding. So looking forward to a lot of corn rootworm injury this year. 
lack of roots because of corn rootworm feeding is going to further exacerbate any nutrient or drought symptoms that we could potentially have as well. I know, I'm full of really, really good news. Another thing to consider is that we've got rootworm beetles starting to emerge as well as first, second, and third instar. So there's feeding that has happened, but there's also a lot of feeding that is going to occur yet. So as we think about these beetles coming out of the soil, I'm also starting to see some Japanese beetles. So this is what your Japanese beetle feeding is going to look like. Um, corn rootworm beetle feeding also looks very similar. Um, looks more similar to this one right here where you get that scraping of the green tissue off. In a lot of cases in Northeast Iowa, we are two to three weeks away from tassel. So we probably will have a fair amount of insect pressure out there. So make sure you're scouting to know your corn rootworm beetle um, levels, as well as your Japanese beetle levels to determine if you wanna throw an insecticide into that fungicide application to protect those silks and protect pollination. So I just spent the entire beginning of this video to talk about lack of rain. And now I'm gonna spend the rest of it about rain because as we look at our forecast we are starting to get into a pattern of more water what does more water mean in northeast iowa it means more tar spot so i have found some very very low levels of tar spot in central iowa i know there's other reports of central iowa of tar spot showing up haven't necessarily found it in northeast iowa yet doesn't surprise me because we haven't had the moisture until now not only that, but you're not gonna usually tend to see diseases of any sort until we get closer to tassel and until that plant starts to switch over to reproductive growth. Now, we've got some water, which means that tar spot's gonna start, it's gonna start its cycle. Um, now, even if we don't get actual precipitation, it's about free water on that leaf. So whether we have high moisture, which is going to mean fog, which is going to mean dew and leaf wetness, that by itself can keep that disease rolling. So we're gonna wanna keep an eye on it. Um, when people ask me about the best application timings, there's two different ways that you can look at it. You can look at it as return on investment, or you can look at it as tar spot control and best yield. If I look at return on investment, that's going to be your V5 followed by your post tassel application. The reason that is your best return on investment is because you're gonna use a size appropriate rate in smaller corn. So you've got a lower cost of, an, of fungicide, plus it's getting a free ride with your herbicide. And then you're gonna do it post tassel. When I look at overall disease control and overall yield from my fungicide applications, particularly when looking at tar spot, I like to make that application that V10 or so, you know, that two weeks before tassel, because you're still gonna get good coverage of that plant further down and you are acting proactively and in a preventative manner, and then go ahead and then also do your post tassel application. Now, if you're looking at making one post tassel application, um, but you wanna do it on the early side because you also wanna keep that preventative, think about increasing your rate. If you're only gonna do one post tassel application, you can look at increasing your Delaro or Delaro Complete up to a 10 or 12 ounce rate. We still have a heck of a corn crop out here, so don't give up on it yet. I don't think we've been hurt too bad. Um, yet, but it's going to take a little bit of management to make sure that we get everything out of it that we want. Let's take a look at the soybeans. Now, soybeans have had a bit of a rough go of it. That's true from the crusting to planting into no moisture and then not getting any moisture afterwards. They've had a rough go of it. Um, they're also been sucking up the little bit of moisture that they had has been very concentrated with herbicides, particularly group 15, which has kept a lot of their leaf tissue tied up and smaller. But they're finally starting to grow out of it. They're finally starting to look better. Here's some things that we're finding. If any of you guys were farming in 2012, this is a familiar sight. The stipling of the leaves, that color, as well as the malformation of these leaves. No, it's not dicamba, it's spider mites. So spider mites are eight-legged arachnids, so they are a mite. 
Uh, they get the name spider mite because they actually have a little bit of webbing on the back of that leaf where they're laying their eggs. Now, spider mites and droughty conditions go hand in hand because they're living in these grassy areas like our road ditches and our grass waterways. But when it's dry, right, we don't get a whole lot of fungal growth in dry conditions. So the parasitic fungus that usually keeps spider mites kind of in their area isn't growing. It's not, com it's not um, controlling their populations. So those populations explode. Not only that, but who has dead grass right now? I do. So crops are a much better food source than the dead grass that they were living in. And it's also easier for them to move out of these areas when there's dry conditions. So we are getting some spider mites moving into the edges. Now, these things can be hard to control. Control options, pyrethroid insecticides don't really work. So you need to choose a dual mode of action insecticide, usually one that contains an organophosphate as well. You also have to be really careful because when you go out and spray these fields with an insecticide that's also a miticide, you gotta remember that you're killing everything else out there. So you could have flare-ups of aphids as well as those spider mites if you aren't careful. I recommend only spraying the affected areas and then continuing to keep an eye on it because if we go out there and spray and kill all of the good insects and predatory insects, we could be causing a flare-up in our spider mite populations as well. How about this? Is anybody seeing beans, especially on those outside edges, looking like this? So just like when we saw potash deficiency in the corn, we're gonna see the same thing in the soybeans. So the newer growth looks better. It's the older leaves that are being affected. So you've got that yellowing on the leaf margins. That's our potash deficiency. Now we are also at risk of nitrogen deficiency in soybeans, which doesn't seem right. However, especially if you're seeing like lighter color soybean out there, that's what it could be is nitrogen deficiency. So a soybean crop, since it is a protein crop, protein is made out of nitrogen, um, a soybean crop is actually going to use more nitrogen than a corn crop. The only difference is, is that a soybean can produce its own nitrogen. So you've got these nodules here, which is really housing for a bacteria that takes nitrogen from the air in the atmosphere and then puts it into a form that the soybean plant can use. So the soybean plant is giving it a place to live. It's giving it sugars and delicious things to eat. And in return, these nodules are going to supply fixed nitrogen to the soybean plant. But obviously there's a catch since the thing that's giving these soybeans, you know, nitrogen is a biological thing. Environment is going to affect that biological thing. So if we are really hot, if we are really dry, or if we are saturated, those bacteria aren't going to work as efficiently as they usually do. And then we could see nitrogen deficiency in the soybeans. I still have a lot of hope for our soybeans. They're finally starting to come into their own. Um, weed control has been somewhat of an issue just because it's so hard to kill water hemp once it comes up. We haven't had a whole lot of activation of our herbicides because of lack of rain. And then once they're up, they are hardening off because of the lack of moisture and the droughty conditions. So weed control in soybeans has been something hard to achieve as well. However, I still have hope because particularly with soybeans, it's like the worse you treat them early on, as long as you treat them good during pod fill, you're usually in a pretty good state. Keep an eye out for your spider mites if we stay dry. Also keep an eye out on your defoliation status, particularly when it comes to our Japanese beetles, which we're starting to see. That's all for now. If you got any questions, call, text, or email.